ask you uh, great opportunity to ask EHV related questions for HUD uh, and uh, through the Q&A box, not through the chat box. You won't be able to do that in this uh, format. Uh, and we're joined today by public housing authorities, COCs, continuums of care, victim service providers, and other partners. Um, today's focus is on program design and specifically on prioritization and referral processes uh, uh, for application and targeted populations. Next, next slide, please. And then one more after that. Um, so as you all just clicked uh, on the sessions, so you know the sessions being recorded and this recording like that for other office hours will be shared at www.hud.gov slash EHV. You're all muted. If you have trouble connecting with your computer audio, you can call in using the following uh, call-in information, uh, which um, uh, Ari, I'm hoping you'll put in the chat box. Again, please submit your questions through the Q&A box. And if you're having any technical issues, please use the Q&A box to let Ari know. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, resource advisors as well as speakers on the phone today. We're joined by from uh, HUD, from the Office of Public and Indian Housing, Jerry Ann Anthony, Emily Warren, Danielle Garcia, uh, Caleb Kotsik, uh, Chad Ruppo, Bob Bipley, Miguel Fontanez, um, and from the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, Caroline Krauss and April Mitchell. I'm Lisa Sloan from TAC, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Emily Sutton, Nicole LeBaire, and Ari Rogers. Uh, we're really excited. In particular, I'll go back to say that uh, we have Bob Bipley and Miguel Fontanez, who are experts in PIH and funding. So housing authorities are encouraged to submit funding-related questions, especially today. Obviously, you should uh, submit uh, all your questions, um, and we'll hope to get them answered. But uh, they are um, here especially to answer those questions today. Next slide. Um, so we have, before we go uh, live with Q&A, we have speakers from three um, organizations uh, from the state of New Hampshire, from the Housing Finance Authority and the uh, Balance of State COC, Gail Quinlan and Stephanie Dahlberg. Uh, from Opening Doors, the COC in Fairfield County, Connecticut, Jessica Kubicki, and from Texas, the Coalition for the Homeless, Houston, Jessica Preheim. So we're really excited to uh, hear from all of them. And uh, let's get started. So we use our time wisely. Uh, Gail and Stephanie, you're up first. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was asked to kind of just go over our process and how we got started. So we basically use the um, HUD notice as our guide. We just uh, reviewed the notice and broke it down. And as we kind of went through each section, we made a list of action items. Some of our major action items were our admin plan changes that we needed to make, um, coming up with our MOU, working on a referral form. We needed to update our website, uh, make some staff reassignments, and then also um, develop some training materials. So we worked through that list as a team uh, we completed all of those tasks and we were ready to start accepting applications as of yesterday. So next slide. Um, so we are very fortunate that we are from a small state and we have existing relationships with our COC referral agencies. Um, so when we were ready to get started, we just sent an email. Um, we included the HUD notice. We set up a meeting, and we just did a you know a quick kind of rundown with all of the agencies combined, and um, everybody was in agreement. It, it went very very smoothly. Um, we have met biweekly since the notice was published. We basically used the template MOU um, provided by HUD. Our MOU was signed last week, um, and uh, on a go forward basis, we will meet weekly as the program gets started to problem solve, collaborate, um, and assess leasing. I think um, obviously leasing will probably be our biggest challenge in this. So next slide. Um, so uh, they just was asked to talk sort of about our referral process. So I, um, I 
created a link here to uh, the referral form that is on our website. Um, so the caseworker, kind of to go through our, our flow, the caseworker, the COC agency um, completes the form. They um, assist the person with the applicant filling out the application. The packet is then sent to the COC representative, which um, is the balance of state and then two other local COCs. They then confirm that the, the client is in coordinated entry. They send the application over to us and then we start the processing from there. So yesterday, we conducted a training with all the COC agencies in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and we described the entire process from referral to lease up I think it went pretty well. They it, it was less than an hour and they didn't have too many questions. So we started receiving our first applications. We got one yesterday and we are ready to issue our first four vouchers today. So we are very excited. Um, one of the things that we did with our service fees, uh, we put in our admin plan that we would use our service fees for housing search assistance, security deposit assistance, landlord incentives, um, application fees and moving fees and other fees that you know might come up as we go forward but I think those are our key fees and then um, another thing that we decided to do is our placement fees uh, we will share those placement fees with the referring COC upon successful leasing of a unit and I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie Dahlberg and she will describe the referral uh, prioritization from the balance of state thank you Gail um, so, as Gil kind of mentioned, um, being in a small state and having already worked together has been really great. Um, the COCs already collaborate with the Housing Authority quite often, and um, this particular Housing Authority covers the entire state, so all of our COCs are involved in the process. Um, we utilized our existing coordinated entry system, as I'm sure everyone else will be doing. And we already had a way through that system to prioritize for the balance of state um, list. We already had a prioritization list ready to go and it has definitely made the process um, a little bit smoother to work together. So the housing authority is just taking whatever referrals we send over. So on our side, um, we are taking in applications and then prioritizing based on the um, the head priorities. We've also been working with TAC to get some ideas and help us refine our processing system a little bit along the way, which has been um, such a, an awesome opportunity during this time. I think that is all I really had to share about our prioritization process. Gail, did you have anything else that you wanted to share for our presentation? I do not, Stephanie. I believe the next slide um, will just has the contact information for myself and Angela Doyle at um, New Hampshire Housing. If, if any of us could um, be of any assistance, we'd be happy to help. And we can also refer you to Stephanie at any time. So thank you. Awesome, thanks guys. Uh, thank you for sharing your process. That link to the referral form, which uh, Nicole has posted up to the chat for everyone who's listening in. And uh, you guys have set the bar pretty high for us all uh, already, um, you know, issuing your vouchers. Congratulations. Nice work. Okay, I'm uh, going to turn it over to Jessica Kibiki from Connecticut, who's going to talk about how things are going there. Uh, and Jessica, I want to remind everyone you're from the COC, so you're going to be talking about things from your end. Correct. Yep. So I think my presentation uh, will be a tad bit different as it's coming from the kind of CAN slash COC uh, side. Yep. Just give Ari one second. No problem. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Um, so obviously, again, I'm Jessica Kabicki. I'm the director of programs with an agency called Supportive Housing Works. We are the backbone agency for our COC. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, so just a quick backstory on our community. Um, so we are in Fairfield County, um, which is the, it's an interesting area. It has the most expensive uh, town in the state. And then also one of the, um, I guess, economically challenged as well. We have uh, in the state of Connecticut, two COCs. So we are one of those two. We have four sub communities. And within those sub communities, we have four kind of 
primary housing authorities. We have developed pretty strong relationships with our local housing authorities. Um, as Gail mentioned, um, we are a smaller state, so it's nice we have spent years building a very strong partnership. Um, so for example, we actually have two of the executive directors from our local housing authorities on the COC coordinating council. So they're a part of our decision-making as well. Um, we've found that both the relationship between the COC and the housing authorities is mutually beneficial. We are able to provide housing authorities with really complete applications, documents that aren't missing. They don't have to maybe um, try and follow a client to get responses. They have a point of contact through us. And then we also help them with the entire process of identifying units, working with the landlords, things like that. So it alleviates the housing authority from being potentially the case manager when they may have a caseload of 300 uh, clients that they're working with with subsidies. And then the benefit for us is that we get to house clients. Uh, next slide. Uh, I just wanted to give you a quick example of the relationship that we already have. This is an excerpt from one of our uh, housing authorities homeless preference from their admin. It's long. I'm assuming you guys will get copies of uh, the slides. The one thing I just wanted to share is this last line that I highlighted. Um, and so this particular housing authority actually issues one in every five vouchers to the CAN and to um, this homeless preference. Preference. It used to be that the homeless preference was for chronic, and they actually reworded it to now say also other vulnerable, uh, just because in some of our sub communities, we have moved past um, matching people when they are already verified chronic, and we actually are able to match clients at that like nine to 12 month mark. So this now allows us that flexibility. Next slide. Um, so we are treating the emergency housing vouchers pretty similar with regards to our uh, collaboration and the relationship and also the referral process, which I'll go through in a second. Next slide. Um, so how did we start this conversation? Um, we actually collaborated with the Department of Housing and each of the representative of the CANs across the state um, to identify what's the most effective way um, to implement these vouchers, which are very different, um, but really exciting into our community. And then the next thing that we did is we did create actually a statewide MOU. So each COC, there's only two, but the COCs and the local housing authorities, we all have one standard uh, MOU that we have all signed. And then we also, because Department of Housing did receive the largest amount of housing vouchers, um, they actually also made sure to give those subsidies to the communities where the local um, housing authorities did not receive the emergency housing voucher. So that way they are equally dispersed amongst the state. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so this is actually our prioritization that we uh, developed with support from Department of Housing. Um, we are targeting uh, primarily the moving on population first. We're doing, there's a, there was a lot of reasons we went back and forth. Some of it is based off of uh, caseload capacity and the fact that while there are dollars um, with these subsidies, how do we maximize who we can house, who's gonna keep the subsidies the longest. Um, and so we're targeting that population first. We do have a statewide moving on policy that we already have implemented that we will be using in order to target. We actually run reports to find who has been in permanent supportive housing the longest. And that's who we identify first, just to ensure that every client is given the opportunity um, to be offered one of these. Not the case manager likes a client maybe more and that's who gets offered the opportunity. Um, and then our next criteria, as you can see, kind of moving down, are those that maybe would not be eligible 
for um, permanent supportive housing. One um, is if they're in rapid rehousing and maybe just financially need the ongoing uh, subsidy but don't need the case management piece. Um, the next, which is number three, falls in line with dedicated plus. Um, and then number four is our literal homeless. Just want to preface um, that, and it actually states really clearly in this, and this is all coming from our MOU, is that we are not suggesting that anyone that's literally homeless is less in need, but in fact, would probably benefit more from the PSH units that these clients are moving on from because they're going to need the ongoing case management support. And so again, trying to maximize the use of these subsidies. And we also just wanted to make sure that we had the caveat in there uh, around our DV households. And so any household that meets category one obviously would fall within um, the literally homeless. And if they're in rapid rehousing, right, same thing, um, but all also the category four definition we wanted to make sure was included in this as well. Next slide. Um, so what does the referral process look like? Again, we are following the same referral process that we already have in place for all of our homeless preferences. Um, the housing authority will notify us normally of when a vacancy becomes available for this, it'll be when we can start submitting referrals, um, which we've actually identified the 7-1 start date for uh, two out of our three housing authorities local. Um, our CAN staff will identify the next appropriate person um, based off the prioritization that I just listed before. And then we actually will assist the client in completing the application and getting all the supplemental documents in a nice little file to give to the housing authority. Um, so I did include what that that file kind of means with regards to the application, the verifications if applicable. So they're not required, right? So it depends on which prioritization we're um, identifying this client for. Income verification, and then the copies of the, the main IDs, and then the bank statements and or, or um, if they have none of that, then the no income affidavit. Um, we submit everything to the housing authority. So the nice thing is the housing authority doesn't have to worry about incomplete applications. We've been filling out their applications for years. So we know what they look for. We know which parts need to be completed. Um, that's one of the benefits that they vocalized to us about receiving applications for our population. They obviously will do you know, their review and their background check just like normal. Next slide. Um, if a client's approved, which is always the easy one, then they will attend a briefing or do whatever is next to receive their subsidy certificate. Um, denied applicants, we actually will have um, the opportunity to appeal that decision and we work with the clients to kind of um, self-advocate for themselves. So depending on if it's a denial for criminal and they're in you know, drug treatment, we'll write letters on behalf or get the providers to write letters. Um, so we make sure that clients have the ability to um, advocate for themselves, but also in a way that they feel um, they're being supported. And then our staff also will help. We have housing coordinators that will help with the housing coordination and apartment search piece. Um, so we'll help them with identifying units, working with the landlords to complete a RAFTA completely and accurately, which I know sometimes can be challenging. Uh, make sure that that gets into the housing authority for a timely inspection. And then our housing coordinators will also assist clients with securing uh, whatever the resources for security deposit. And if they have any arrearages, we also um, make sure to address those ahead of time so that they don't come up on the day of a lease signing. Next slide. Okay, we're saving them for after. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. That was awesome. Um, so uh, finally, we have, uh, uh, we have, um, Jessica Preheim from Texas, who's going to talk about uh, how, uh, again, she is from the COC and she's going to uh, talk about how they are working on this with their housing authority and uh, kind of how they've come up with their prioritization, um, uh, the background on that. So Jessica, take it away. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm probably coming from a perspective that's somewhat in the middle of a COC and a PHA. I work for the COC, but I am a former employee of the Housing Authority. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So we are a pretty large COC. We cover um, all of Harris, Fort Bend, and Montgomery County in Houston, Texas. Uh, since 2011, we have been working very, very closely with our housing authorities in the region. And with that collaboration, uh, we have reduced homelessness overall by 54%, and we have housed actually over 22,000 individuals, uh, close to 4,000 of those individuals being since October of this year. Um, and uh, we have about a 90% retention rate. Next slide. When we started this uh, planning process with our housing authority, uh, we really looked at what are the system demands uh, that we're seeing from our wait list, uh, how many units we have available, and where we're really seeing some of the gaps. Uh, so we mapped out uh, how many, uh, what are our really, like our very concrete gaps that we have that are reoccurring every year based on the populations and the inflow and our housing rate that we're seeing every year. So we found that we have a, significant gap of uh, PSH for people who are experiencing uh, chronic homelessness, but also some of those individuals who traditionally get sent to wrapper housing because they don't have that chronic status, but really have that high service need. So we took this into consideration in our planning process. Next slide. Then we did a few things. We worked with our housing authority to say, not only will you accept these vouchers, but if there's an opportunity to accept more vouchers, would you be willing to do that? And we came to kind of a mutual number. Um, and then we thought, what are some of our main goals? So together we decided that we really want to continue to transform our homeless response system. We uh, want to end chronic homelessness. We are very, very close in Houston to ending chronic homelessness. Uh, we want to really focus on unsheltered homelessness in large encampments, as we know this is a very visible and political issue. Next slide. And so with that, we have been looking um, at not only what are the um, what are the vouchers that are coming into the community, but what are other some of the uh, resources that are coming to our entitlements and our city and county. And so we did meetings together, not only with our housing authorities, but with our city and county funders and elected officials to think how can we layer on uh, these funding. And I know one big challenge is, is that sometimes funding timelines don't always align with the timing of the vouchers. So we're thinking through that uh, collectively, thinking about how we could add additional funding to existing contracts. Uh, we um, have been thinking about how we can streamline procurement, how we braid funding, uh, and we also have been having a lot of conversations. One of our challenges is is that um, because a lot of the service dollars are a reimbursement based um, partnership with our city and county, some of our partners are running out of the float. So we're really working to strategize with our city and county if there's ways to financially um, assist our service provider partners. And then we're thinking about how we secure units. Uh, we've been um, we've been housing a lot of people really quickly in Houston, and we're starting to run low on one bedroom. So we're working with the housing authority to think about some marketing um, and some other ways to bring those in. Next slide. So some things that we found really work in Houston is a single point of contact uh, who works with the housing authority from the COC. We um, upload all of our documents, um, all of our voucher packets, um, all of our supporting documentation directly into HMIS, and our housing authority actually pulls them down. So there's no hard copy delivery um, that happens in our system. It's also a great storage in case anything is misplaced or lost. Uh, our housing authority then goes in and actually uh, checks, says past inspection, wrapped to receive, uh, but really follows the process through in HMIS so that there is streamlined communication with our case management staff. So that's been something that's really beneficial. It's taken us several years to kind of get that down and really think through that process. We're also uh, working with our social security office to have a single point of contact uh, to be able to get award letters uh, in social security cards as this has been a barrier in the past. Um, it gets challenging once you move someone in sometimes to get the, the documents after you move them in. So we're really uh, working on those partnerships. And on the housing authority side, some things that we're thinking through is how do we also ensure that there's a single point of contact with the housing authority? Uh, we have other preferences, but we know that um, this is an opportunity uh, to really streamline that process. We have weekly meetings uh, and meetings in the beginning are twofold. There is an executive meeting and then there is a partnership partner meeting, which is really the case management staff, 
um, some of the management staff at the Housing Authority, but really everyone who's working on the front line with the clients. Um, and so we have that. And those, that's going to continue for uh, <laughs> probably the first year, uh, those weekly meetings. Next slide. So again, some of our rewards as we thought through this process is we are going to make, we like to make ambitious goals. We are, want to end chronic homelessness. We want to eliminate all of our large encampments. Uh, we want to shorten the time that it takes uh, for someone from referral to lease up. So far in our community, we've been able to drop a referral from a few years ago. It took us about 370 days. Now we're down to 32 days to get someone into housing. Um, so we want to get that under 30 days. Uh, and then uh, we really want to see a reduction in our overall uh, point in time count. Next slide. So this is kind of what our structure looks like. Uh, when I say we meet a lot, we meet a lot. Um, right now, we have weekly housing authority meetings with both housing authorities and lead agency and our domestic violence um, representatives. Uh, we go through what is our leasing schedule going to go uh, look like, what is our staffing schedule going to need to be to roll on to keep up with the vouchers and housing navigation, our communication plan and meeting structure, the use of service fees. For us, we are going to use the service fees for housing navigation. We kind, this is kind of different than housing search assistance. For us, this really means meeting someone on the streets, walking them, you know, if they need to go to get an ID, uh, they're taking them to get that ID, uh, they're taking them to the social security office, they work with them to sign their lease, and they really follow them all the way through the housing process. Once they're housed, then there's a warm handoff to a case manager who takes over the long-term case management. Um, we're, again, uh, we're going to continue to work through how we use HMIS, but we also have a funders meeting. Uh, this is a little larger group. This is where we bring in our city, our county, um, philanthropy, and our housing authorities to think through how we layer on that service funding to properly support the individuals that we want to house. Um, and then we think about the timeline, because again, funding timelines can be a challenge, but we really try to use this meeting as a barrier buster. We can say all the problems that we have as long as we bring a solution to the table. And so we really try to work through that with that mentality. And then we have weekly elected official meetings as we try to kind of sell this big collaborative idea um, so that we can layer on some of the other funding um, uh, resources that are coming into our community. And then lastly, we have weekly provider meetings where we meet with all of our uh, service providers who do housing navigation as well as case management. Uh, we go name by name. We then meet with executive staff to see if there's any other issues in the process. Next slide. So this is just another, again, uh, we're making some goals for ourselves. So with the use of these vouchers and the other dollars that are coming through, it is our goal to really see some drastic changes. Um, we want to get our average time from referral to lease up under 30 days. We want to end chronic homelessness. We want to eliminate all of our large shelters and really see a large reduction in unsheltered homelessness in our next point in time count. Next slide. This is just, I won't go into details, but, uh, we're looking at this not just as a voucher and a COC relationship, but we're expanding it beyond that to think through what is what are other resources that we need um, that we can stand up alongside this partnership. So we're looking at rapid rehousing that we can expand. We're looking at the mental health supports, the substance abuse so, source uh, supports. Uh, we're also thinking about um, the project management that it takes uh, from as a lead agency to make sure this all happens. Uh, and we're layering this on um, to our COVID response. So we're looking to um, to probably serve around 6,000 individuals uh, with about uh, one to 2,000 of those uh, with the vouchers. So we're really looking at this as a holistic um, goal. Next slide. That's it. Great, uh, great. Thank you so much for presenting. Uh, presenting all that. Uh, you guys are all doing a great job. I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Nicole, uh, who's got some questions, I think, for all of you presenters. Awesome, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, starting with our presenters, our first question is for Jessica Kubuki. Do you send, and sorry if I just slaughtered your last name. <laughs> Do you send two referrals for every one voucher open to account for clients falling out of the process? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so for some of our housing authorities, no, we don't. Um, for 
some, one in particular, yes. Um, the reason being is because the housing authority does their own background check. And then the units that we try to send more than one applicant for the, um, property management ooh, um, does their own set of backgrounds and are actually sometimes stricter than the housing authority. And so we find that even though they pass the housing authority, they may not always pass the background check for the property management. And then that causes longer delays for our project-based units. And then that cycles into the funding and we don't want them to be in the red and all of that. Um, so it depends, um, you, we certainly have before, yes. Great, I love the way you highlighted the challenges going from PHA to owner acceptance. So it's yeah, not yeah. just about that voucher piece. So uh, a follow up to that, Jessica, do you send, is that, that's the same question, pardon me. Okay, so next question is just for all the presenters. Is the COC staff or their contracted providers completing the PHA applications? And Jessica, if you want to go first. Like physically, like writing them, you mean? Well, I would imagine helping the participants yes. complete so, the application, making sure everything's yes. uh, filled yes. out. Yep, we absolutely do that. Um, I guess the reason I was asking physically is there are certainly times that we have to um, because we do have clients that you know struggle to write or read um, and need some assistance. Obviously, the signatures is totally different, um, but yes, we help them depending on their needs with all of it, with some of it. Um, and then we review everything the case managers do. And then they send it to the CAN staff, the point of contact, and we review it again before it even gets to the housing authority. Awesome, thanks. And Stephanie, do you wanna answer that question for your community? Yes, our community is doing very similar. Um, the COC uh, partners are doing the applications with the clients and providing whatever support they need. And then we are sending them over um, through that one point of contact, which would be need for balance of state to New Hampshire housing. Thanks, Stephanie. And Gail, I saw you nodding your head. So assuming you're good with Stephanie's response. Absolutely, and yep. Where they're okay. sending over complete packages. So that has been really helpful. We've, we've been doing them electronically, kind of uploading them through Teams or you know securely through email. Back, so. And Jessica Preham, if you want to add? Yeah, we again, we do something very similar case managers help and we have something what's called pre navigation. So if someone's on a wait list, and there might not be a voucher ready for them initially, but we know they will qualify the housing navigators or the outreach staff actually have copies of the application. And they start filling it out ahead of time so they have it they just don't date it until we know that we can send the referral so that on the housing authority side by the time they get it it is still current so that's just one other layer and we also just to the uh, number of referrals we send we send multiple referrals for every slot but again a lot of times this does come back not to the housing authorities criteria and screening out but of properties and sometimes it can take longer so if we really want to think about fast lease ups we send multiple referrals Thanks, Jessica. And Jessica Kubicki, I think maybe I did better this time. This question, I think is for you because it's about CAN. So can you please restate what type of agency CAN is? Are they a COC or a partner agency? That oh, does so service? sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. So the CAN is the Coordinated Access Network, um, which is inevitably the homeless response system that all the service providers are a part of. I'm so sorry. I should not assume that that is universal lingo. No worries. I am glad that you got the opportunity to clarify. And then the next question is for all the presenters. Are any of you all willing to share your MOUs? Yes, we would be happy to. Yeah, I mean, I would sure. probably want to just double check with our Department of Housing since they drafted it, um, but I can't imagine, we've shared a lot of different things, so I can't imagine that that would be an issue at all. Awesome. Yeah, and then we can I share it as well. <laughs> Go ahead. 
I'll say we can share as well, but we actually have a pretty unique MOU that looks a little different, um, but we've shared it in the past. I love it. And then I think on the tech end, we'll figure out how to get that information out to all the attendees, whether it's on that EHV webpage with the recording of these office hours. Uh, last question for the presenters. How are communities planning around housing search? Uh, we are hearing that many of our coordinated entry providers who make referrals are maxed out and unable to help with intensive housing search. So whoever wants to take that first. Uh, I can start. Um, and so we actually use some of our CARES funding for housing coordinator positions, understanding that obviously that is not forever long term, um, but certainly has been helping us right now. Um, we've actually really struggled with um, the inventory. I forget. I'm sorry. Somebody mentioned the inventory as well, which is definitely very challenging. And then also the inflated rent prices we're seeing. And so we've actually started to also utilize some landlord incentives um, if there are instances where that may actually help a landlord be open to accepting one of our clients. Um, so we've tried that as well. Um, so for New Hampshire housing, I think, you know, we have dedicated staff, um, I think some housing authorities call them navigators, we call them expediters. Um, so we have dedicated staff that are in the community daily and, you know, working with people around the state, um, we are trying to make ourselves be their first call when they have an available unit. Um, you know, we're very inexpensive, cheap advertising for available units. <laughs> Uh, we put them on our website um, anytime that you know anytime they have anything open. We are also also doing the landlord incentive. Um, we will do a email blast to all of our current landlords, letting them know that there's an incentive for these vouchers. And then I also believe I know Balance of State and the other COC agencies um, will also be working with the clients. You know the COCs are kind of the more the boots on the ground than the housing authority, but. Um, they will also be assisting us with Lisa. Thanks for that. We do something uh, pretty similar to, I would say that we have an entire landlord engagement team, but have intentionally um, uh, uh, located that at um, the continuum of care. So it's with the lead agency. Uh, so we have that, that works, uh, this team works on behalf of every uh, client who's been housed within our system. And we're looking to double that team uh, we do use landlord incentive fees. So right now we're actually, because of the uh, lack of one bedroom units, we're doing uh, intensive networking um, and surveys with our uh, landlord partners to see, is there something that would get them to yes? And so that is continual. We have weekly onboardings with all the properties. That's really a Q and A. And then we also do networking so that landlords who are current participants can start to work with uh, property owners who may be new uh, so that's really something else that has been pretty successful for us. Thanks, Jessica. That concludes our questions for our presenters. So definitely want to thank you all again for taking the time to share your amazing work on this program. So we'll roll into some questions uh, for HUD. So I will start with, there seems to be lots of questions about the PHA contracting with the COC. So Bob or Caleb, maybe this question is best for you. Um, the, can the PHA contract with the COC for any of the service fee eligible activities per their own uh, procurement requirements? Uh, the answer is yes, they can, as long as they follow their procurement requirements policy requirements, um, it's expected that it will probably happen for most agencies. Perfect, thanks, Bob. The next question that I have, Emily, is for you. If an EHV person wishes to port to a PHA that does not administer EHVs, does the initial PHA still need to make sure the supportive services are provided if the receiving PHA is absorbing the client under the Housing Choice Voucher Program. 
I think I'd have to defer to someone else from PH who's um, more well versed in the financial reporting. I think we're working on some additional written guidance in this area. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe it might be wet, better to wait on this one until, um, until the guidance comes out. Got it, sorry about that. Let's go with our next question that we have is for Caroline. Can you please take a moment to discuss the role of balance of state COCs compared to local coordinated entry organizations. We are in Washington state, balance of state, and struggling to understand the different roles and responsibilities. Hey, yeah, thanks for that question. So that is a really great question, especially for these large balance of state uh, continuums that have um, kind of enacted their coordinated entry system so that it's in a more regional way. So what we're, what we're recommending is that the um, COC enters into the, um, into the MOU with the PHA, uh, with a PHA, but the COC is just a signatory and you also have someone that from the local coordinated entry network or however you are um, implementing that um, on MOU. So that can really, um, you can go through what the responsibilities are for each party uh, within those. Um, and so then that's how you the the roles can be outlined and and specifying that those uh, referrals are coming from the more localized coordinated entry system rather than maybe a statewide one. Thanks, Caroline. Our next question is about shared housing, and it seems to be coming from a number of people. So, um, Emily, maybe you can speak to if shared housing is allowed under the EHB program. Sure. So, yes, it would be allowed if that was the family's choice. Um, the same uh, requirements that apply to shared housing in the regular housing choice voucher program, which is applied to EHB as well. Perfect, thank you. And Emily, another question for you. This is regarding the placement fees. Someone is just asking, um, what are the placement fees? And I know they are outlined on page eight and nine of the notice, but if you wanna go into a little more detail. Sure, so the placement fees are really intended to help support the initial costs um, experienced by PHAs um, in getting an, uh, EHVs leased up and also in getting them uh, leased up quickly. So costs like um, office space, utilities, um, phone line, things like that. Thanks, Emily. And looks like Caroline, we have a couple of HMIS questions. So the first one is, uh, will the PHA be provided with access to HMIS? So there are a couple uh, different answers to this. So PHAs uh, can be organizations that have access to HMIS, particularly if um, the EHVs are gonna be created as a particular project um, that would be matching COC funds, which would need to be entered into HMIS as a project, matching those funds, or ESG actually, um, matching those funds with EHV for the housing assistance. In those cases, it may make a lot of sense uh, for the PHAs to have access to those to that project as well. Um, so yes, in some situations, um, I will say, you know, we've had a question come up of whether um, COCs can just go in, or PHAs can have access to HMIS and get the referrals that way. That's a little, I mean, as long as the COC is sending the referrals, that works. It can't be that the PHA is just going into HMIS to get, get the people that they think should be brought over. Those referrals still have to come from the COC. Thanks, Caroline. And in follow-up to that, uh, people are asking if EHVs are required to be entered into HMIS? So they're not required to be entered into HMIS. Uh, we are creating a new data standard for coordinated entry um, where a referral to, or sorry, an entry into a, a referral over to the EHV program 
um, is going to be a specific item. Those will come into effect uh, on October 1, 2021. Um, but we are releasing the data standard, um, the data standard outlines to vendors, hopefully in the next week or two, um, and encouraging them to implement those as soon as possible. Thanks. And it looks like we have a couple more questions for you, Caroline, if you don't mind. Are victim service providers required to submit identifying information of the households they are referring to a PHA for an EHB? So that, um, that is a hard question. There needs to be enough information to say that the person that's being referred is um, eligible for the voucher. Um, but it's really important, particularly with those victims of um, domestic violence or trafficking, um, that privacy and safety needs to be really um, prioritized. Um, so I would suggest that only the right, uh, only the absolutely needed information should be sent over, and there should be processes in place to make sure that those are sent in a secure form um, and that the records are not kept in an open environment, but are follow the kind of document guidelines for safety um, that are included in the VAWA Act. Thank you. Our next question is for Emily. Emily, can you give us some tangible examples of housing readiness activities that can be funded with the service fee? Sure. So some of the examples in the notice refer to helping families with things like a negative credit history or lack of credit history, um, maybe something like an eviction on their record, um, or other sort of poor rental or utility histories that might make it difficult for them to find uh, a unit and a landlord willing to rent to them. And so if you're looking for some more specific examples, there's some really good stuff uh, being done on this in the housing mobility space. So if you did some Googling, maybe like for the Baltimore housing uh, mobility program or for the creating moves to opportunity program, you might, um, or contacted them, you might be able to find some spe specific examples of curriculum being used in things like renters workshops for maybe uh, families that have never rented before or who haven't rented in a long time. Um, other th things like that to just um, help uh, make, uh, help them pre present themselves as a really uh, good tenant. That's helpful. Thanks, Emily. Caroline, I think the next question might be best for you and or others might want to weigh in, but what are the benefits to PSH clients for accepting a move on EHB voucher? Uh, the benefits to the system and our ability to serve more people are clear, but it's hard to see why an individual household would voluntarily switch uh, from COC PSH to EHB? That's a really good question. And I want to make sure that I initially emphasize that moving on is always a choice for the client. It is never required. Um, so just to make sure that that is, um, you know, really at the forefront of, of client choice. Um, so there are some clients that do choose to move on, uh, and there are a number of reasons. So, um, for instance, if they're coming from a, a, a place-based or project-based uh, PSH unit, they may be wanting to move to um, a tenant-based voucher so that they have more choice in where they can live, um, or they may be able to choose a larger unit instead of, you know, a lot of PSH units are, are um, single room occupancy, and so they may be able to have more independent living. Um, some people want to get out of the case or want to stop with um, the case management services and have a little bit more independence. Um, and some may be looking to move uh, closer to friends, family, community connections. Um, so if a, a client is indicating that they want to do moving on, you know, there can be a number of benefits to both them and the, the system flow. Thank you. Another question for you and somewhat similar, if all EHB vouchers are used for people currently in rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing and stay in their unit, do we still need to provide housing search assistance for these clients or will the housing search provided by the COC programs at the time they were housed count as housing search assistance? 
Um, so that's a really interesting question. I want to point out that in PIH notice 2021-15, the housing search assistance um, definition is really broad. Likely in switching from the rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing to an EHV, there will be some costs incurred or some supportive services given to that client, either through filling out the application. I'm not sure what else. The, there, there will be probably some costs and those and some services given, and those will qualify as the housing search assistance there. So it isn't that every how every person uh, if they are coming, you know, from a PSH or RRH unit may not they aren't required to get a certain level of housing search assistance or the exact same housing search assistance. Um, but housing search assistance is, is very general. And I think um, it, I, I would imagine in almost all cases, there will be some housing search assistance as defined in the notice um, given to every client. Thanks, Caroline. Our next question is for Caleb or Bob. Our PHA will be sharing the service fee with the COC service providers. Are there any requirements we need to be made aware of? Also, does sharing the service fee kick in HUD financial slash uniform administrative requirements? This is a question that we'll have to bring in our CPD. Um, counterparts because you're starting to talk about sub recipients of federal funds and those requirements at the PIH level, um, we don't get into those requirements. So we will have to get back to you on that. Thanks, Bob. A uh, follow up to that, that might uh, warrant the same answer, but can the COC contract with the service provider that they select then bill the PHA? The PHA then pays the invoice to the COC to pay the service provider. Uh, that's all dependent upon the PHA and the COC's procurement policies. In some cases, we've seen procurement policies where um, the subcontractor or the COC has to remit first to the COC who has to review the bill to make sure that the service was provided, then they forwarded on to the PHA. In other cases, depending on the procurement, um, procurement policies of the agencies, it may be able to be done how it was discussed in that question but it's really dependent upon the procurement policy. Understood, thanks, Bob. Um, the next question that I have is for Emily. Can we use service fees in a combination with admin fees to hire a case manager to provide supportive services? Um, so I would maybe um, defer to Chad or Caleb to uh, make sure this is correct, but I believe so as long as the case manager is providing um, services that are eligible uses of the services fee. Sounds correct to me. I agree. This is Miguel. Thanks, Miguel. So we have just about four minutes left. I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa to wrap us up with next steps. Next slide, please. Okay, just a few reminders. Um, uh, the uh, MOU deadline uh, is July, 31st. Um, so that's coming up uh, in about five or six weeks. I haven't counted exactly pretty soon. Um, if you have questions that were not answered today, uh, please send them to the EHV mailbox, ehv at hud.gov. Uh, reminder that office hours, EHV office hours are every Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time, and that today's recording and all the materials will be posted to the EHV website, which again is www.hud.gov backslash EHV. Uh, so on 
uh, want to thank all of the presenters today. I think we just got a lot of awesome information and groups are really setting the bar high for all of us uh, in terms of program implementation. Uh, and thanks to all um, the HUD staff and resource folks who are here answering questions. Uh, more to come uh, next week. So uh, thanks everyone and we'll see you here again uh, in a week.